Amanda. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. We are excited that so many of you from across the country could join us today as we discuss the Tech Access Project. This presentation is the third installment of a four-part e-learning series done in conjunction with our annual Big Hearted campaign. I'll share more about that later. Some of you might already know about it. We're still going to talk about it a little bit later. My name is Jade Atkins. I am the Development Manager in the San Francisco Bay Area Tahere office, and I'll be moderating this presentation um, and discussion today. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my incredible colleagues um, and today's presenters, Chrisel Rigoro, who is our Pro Bono Network Coordinating Attorney, and Nikki Ensley, our Skadden Fellow. Both of them serve with me out of our San Francisco office. Thank you both so much for being here. They are incredible. And I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much, Jade. Um, we're going to get started with a presentation. So I'm going to turn our cameras off so that we could focus on our slides. All right. Again, thank you so much, Jade. Um, we are very excited to share about the work that we have been doing with the Tech Access Project. The Tech Access Project is co-led by myself, Nikki Ensley, who's in this call, and our former social worker, Juliana Pessoa. It's a combination of various client-centered tech interventions, tech-related activities and tools that our San Francisco Bay Area team has developed to better support our clients and to ensure that our clients continue to be able to meaningfully participate in their cases. So there are tools, these are tools that we've been dreaming of even before the pandemic and the shelter in place orders and before everything moved to remote work. Um, one of the side effects of the pandemic is that it has forced us to implement tech related solutions to better serve our clients and today, we will give you some information on that. So quick um, overview of the agenda. We will cover um, some of the background of the project and give you an overview of our tech-related responses. Um, we're also going to be talking about our client survey. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and then Jade will cover our big hearted campaign. So on to the background. So first we will cover the background. And if you can imagine back to March, as we were all dealing with growing concerns and fears around COVID-19, um, what it is, how it spreads, the impact that it's having on communities and the fear, the fear that surrounded many of us um, and the various shelter in place orders that mandated our office to work remotely. So, Next slide, please. You know, COVID-19 has upended our clients' lives and had a devastating impact to many of our clients. Our clients were already dealing with a difficult legal context that made it more difficult for them to access immigration relief. On top of that, COVID-19 created intersecting threats of eviction, homelessness, hunger, physical and emotional harm and illness, including COVID-19. And without reliable income because of loss of employment or access to health insurance because or public benefits because of their undocumented status, many of our clients face increasing challenges and have needed more support than ever. Next slide. So in response to this need that's increased, um, we've seen a huge increase in our clients' requests for assistance between Q1 um, January to March and Q2 April to June of this year. So that means we've seen a um, 138% increase in the number of clients requesting assistance just to make um, basic needs to ensure that those were met. We've seen a 160% increase in the number of clients requesting referrals to food banks and a 900% increase in the number of clients requesting financial assistance for other needs. Next slide, please. So as Chriselle touched on a bit, um, our organization transitioned to fully remote work in March because of shelter in place orders. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
which complicated our response to this already challenging legal and social um, back, background, I guess you could say. Um, so routine things, just like obtaining a client's signature, now takes many times longer and requires logistical strategizing. Um, it's become difficult to track court and agency procedures um, to uh, COVID-19 as approaches have greatly differed. Um, there was a time there where uh, here in San Francisco, we were learning of whether or not cases were going forward that been on the docket for, for years, just with a couple weeks notice. Um, we also have been responding to increased requests from survivors for um, meeting their basic needs, uh, which we've also mentioned previously. And then against this backdrop, um, the current uh, presidential administration has continued with some of their um, chaotic legal changes. Um, we'll just name it as that. <clears throat> so our client's compounded vulnerability has really only been exacerbated in COVID-19 times. Um, but we know that by building efficiencies into working with advocates and by info sharing, we can decentralize our own power and lift up that of our clients. So by putting information directly into the hands of survivors, we will do, we're doing our best to sustainably empower them and their communities, helping to build power amongst those who are directly affected. And to that end, we have implemented tech practices and begun shaping policies that are uh, that would allow us to do just that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and as Nikki mentioned, you know, this changing context for our clients really required us to adapt and think of different ways to respond to the changing needs of our clients. And one of the ways that we have done that is by um, ensuring that we respond through technology. We want to make sure that our clients continue to receive up-to-date information and high-quality services. Um, in addition to this, we also um, opened up our client funds to be able to help our clients pay their phone bills because we recognize that technology is one of their main access or one of the main ways that they are able to access services. So we're going to go over some of the responses that we had during the pandemic. One of the main um, one of the main uh, responses, and um, I think exciting ways that we've responded is through the development of informational videos. We develop animated videos as an engaging way to share information with our clients and to ensure that our clients receive information regardless of their literacy level. And one way um, that we realized we could efficiently mass message important information to our clients was via mass texting. Um, so we have sent out many messages in English and in Spanish, um, sharing things like the informational videos that Chriselle just mentioned. Um, we also shared Know Your Rights information, uh, client resource um, document, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about in a moment information about accessing benefits during this time, um, eviction moratoriums in their areas, um, solidarity messages, um, info about curfews that were being imposed during some of the social justice protests um, earlier this year, information about contact tracing, um, and things like that. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> We also created um, an, a huge database of um, client resources on a number of topics. Um, so you, what you're seeing now is kind of a screenshot of the English version. We also have a Spanish version. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of organizations and individuals were aggregating information together, um, but a lot of it was very, um, very much still in, in disparate places. So we wanted to aggregate information for our clients and met our clients' needs in one place. So we did things like pull together um, local uh, public health alerts by county, 
um, in this list, information for undocumented communities to access emergency relief funds, information about um, help hotlines for survivors of domestic and sexual violence, uh, many of whom were feeling particularly isolated during this time, or some of whom were even continued, had to continue living with their um, abusers and were now sheltering in place with their abusers. We also shared information for um, identity subgroups like LGBTQI immigrants, those with disabilities. We shared information about stimulus checks, um, employment and job security information, schooling, entertainment for children, Medi-Cal and covered California, um, some medical programs, uh, healthcare programs in, in California, information about food banks, pantries, rental and eviction assistance, self-care, community care, um, all this information we daily aggregated in this document, which we shared with our clients so that they could access it on their own. One of the exciting things that came out of working remotely for us are the virtual legal clinics. Through the virtual legal clinics, we were able to support our clients in completing applications for unemployment benefits and green cards. Um, because it is all virtual, we were able to have volunteer attorneys and volunteer interpreters from all over the country participate. We had volunteers from various parts of California, from Washington, from Florida, and even Nebraska. It was also client-centered because our clients were able to meet with their attorneys on their own terms without having to commute to a location or to arrange for daycare or childcare. Um, for example, we had a client who had a newborn baby who probably would not have been able to participate in an in-person legal clinic, but because of video conferencing technology, she was able to participate and complete her green card application. Next slide. We also developed video tutorials to help our clients with different aspects of their case. For example, this is a video that our young and incredible volunteer, Tara Samimi, created for us. Tara is a high school student who is a member of the Tahere Justice Club at her school. So this is an example and we will play this for you. There is no audio, but this, um, the audio is not playing, but it has a really wonderful background music and also um, we'll have a voiceover with this. And this is really one of the ways that Gen Z volunteers can contribute to our work. Um, this video was inspired by TikTok videos and we found it as a useful and meaningful way to share information through short videos that we could text to our clients. Thank you. Next slide. So the client survey. Um, knowing that remote, uh, we're likely to be providing legal services remotely in the future, we wanted to interrogate some of the assumptions that we have about our clients and how they use technology so that we could develop tools and resources that is evidence-based. And Nikki is gonna go over the tech survey that we have developed. Thanks, Chriselle. So the, the client survey is just one aspect of what we're calling the tech survey. So we, we've conducted a comprehensive, um, multifaceted yet integrated <laughs> analysis of what tools are available and how we really could better serve our clients. Um, so one aspect of that was the tech tools research. So we utilize volunteers to do preliminary research on tech tools on the market. Um, we also uh, engage pro bono efforts to conduct a survey of remote legal service provision models for working with migrants around the world and best practices for ensuring client engagement and confidentiality within those models. 
We also conducted a short staff survey to better understand staff needs and what kind of tools staff were already using. Um, and then there's the client survey. So we are really deeply invested in our remote work model being client-centered and being driven by data about the communities we serve. And to that end, we began an extensive client survey that aimed to reach every one of our clients um, to discern concrete information, um, which Chriselle will expand upon shortly. Next slide, please. So big picture, um, so far 65 out of our uh, 124 households um, that we serve in our office in San Francisco have taken the um, survey via phone using um, or with volunteers. So the phone interviews lasted between on average 15 to 30 minutes. And we had um, a trained cohort of seven volunteers or multilingual um, who conducted these phone interviews and collected the data as they went along. Thank you, Nikki. And as Nikki mentioned, we are highly invested in ensuring that our future technological interventions are client-centered and also that our survey is client-centered. So the client survey had several objectives. The first one is the data tool identification, which essentially is that we wanted to know what are the tools that our clients are already using. Um, we also wanted to identify where there are gaps in technological literacy so that we could bridge those gaps either through video tutorials or other types of information. Um, we also wanted to know, you know, what are our clients' preferred applications or preferred apps so that we can meet them where they're at and use the technology that they're already using. And we also wanted to know about the consistency of access, whether internet access impacts their ability to access services and information. Um, we also ask questions about privacy concerns, and also we wanna know how they were doing during COVID and how COVID has impacted not just their ability to access services, but how they're using technology. Next slide. So we will be sharing um, some preliminary findings from this survey, but we do hope to share a more comprehensive report about our findings. Our hope is to be able to scale this client survey to all of our offices so that we have a more comprehensive data. Um, one of the pre preliminary findings that we have is the um, primary devices that our clients use. So we learned that over 92% of our clients use phone uh, only and about 6% use phone and tablet or computer. And then about 1.5% did not response. So what does this tell us? This tells us that any type of information or resource that we will design in the future has to be accessible by phone. Next slide. We also asked some questions about their access to the internet and the, um, the information we gather gets more granular than this, Wi-Fi versus data, where you access, things like that. But on a macro scale, 89.2% of our clients said that they do have access to the internet. 3.1% said that they did not. 1.5% clarified that they access only through their phone. Um, and 6.2% um, gave no answer. Um, in terms of what this tells us also is that something, an intervention that is web-based may be limited to only, you know, the majority of the clients. There will be always someone who's losing out if we use tools that are solely web-based. We also asked about how comfortable they were using different messaging apps. 81.5% um, said that they were comfortable. 6.2% uh, said not comfortable, 4.6% uh, specified that they were comfortable with iMessage and Facebook Messenger only, and then 7.7% did not give an answer. And we had some open-ended questions. Um, this question is specifically about how COVID has changed the way that they've connected with their community. And one of the general themes that we found was how um, COVID has had an isolating impact. 
and our you know clients are not able to have a genuine connection they feel very alone um, they have fears or have been impacted by evictions or having to move their um, having uh, they're also uh, depressed and um, need additional support to live uh, including help with their children and schooling and generally that COVID has impacted every aspect of their lives. Another open-ended question we asked was if um, just to follow up on some of the tech interventions and tools that we were already employing during COVID to see if they were actually being useful. Um, were questions like these, like, did you remember a list of resources that we sent out a few months ago? And this was in reference to the client resource document, which we mentioned previously, which was sent out to clients via text um, in English and in Spanish, depending on their primary language. Um, and we learned from, from different clients um, what they used it for, if they used it at all. Um, many clients said they found it helpful um, one mentioned that they, they learned about places where they could find help um, and know your rights information, what to do if they were pulled over by ICE. Um, another mentioned they used it to find free food. Um, another mentioned they used it to successfully apply for unemployment assistant on their, assistance on their own. Another said they used it to successfully apply for a PEBT card, which um, is our food benefits to help families with children and that they did it so on their own using just the information we shared for, with them. Um, and this is just a fun anecdote. One said that they used the child care entertainment section to sign up for a Zoom dance class that they did with their young daughter. Again, those are preliminary findings that we have, and we hope to share a more detailed um, report with everyone about um, how uh, COVID has impacted our clients, but also what types of technologies are going to be useful for future interventions. Any questions? Thank you, Chriselle and Nikki. I'm going to give folks just a few seconds to, if they have any questions, pop them in the chat um, and I can read them out. In the, in the meantime, though, I do have a question for you guys before we dive into those, if there are any. I just want to ask the two of you, you know, what, what next steps can people do? What are things that people can do on the grounds right now? What can thank folks you. do to kind of get involved? Yeah, thank you, Jade. Um, you know, what we've learned um, with COVID and working remotely is that um, the types of volunteer needs that we have have expanded. So an example that you saw there was that tutorial video that was developed by our wonderful volunteer, Tara. Um, you know, that's one of the ways that um, that used to be, um, we didn't used to have that volunteer need. And now, if you know, um, with development of TikTok and video tutorials, that has become one of the primary ways that we could share information. So if you have any technology skills that you could contribute, um, please uh, reach out and volunteer to us. And uh, again, um, you can always volunteer as a pro bono attorney. Um, if you have legal skills, we're always in need of uh, pro bono attorneys to represent our clients in their full scope cases or to do research or to participate in our legal clinics. Thank you for that question. Yeah, and it looks like we have another question. I'm, we're just having some, here's the question. It says, what do you think is the low proportion regarding IM and FB? It's from a, someone named Lata. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Maybe clarify what IM and FB is if we don't. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but maybe you, Nikki, and Christelle do messaging, perhaps? iMessage and Facebook. There we go. What do you think is the low proportion regarding iMessage and Facebook? That's a really interesting question. And um, Nikki, if you have also any insight on this, um, you know, we are going to, we're, we're still at the preliminary um, stage of our analysis. Um, I could only like make an assumption about the low proportion of this, but I, 
it has um, a lot to do with a lot of our clients really using WhatsApp as a primary way of um, messaging because that's uh, what's used outside of the United States. And I know that a lot of our clients continue to communicate with family members abroad um, through WhatsApp and um, yeah, outside of the iMessage and Facebook platforms. Any additions to that, Nikki? Yeah, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head, um, Chriselle. I think um, you know preliminary glances of the data show us that many many people use WhatsApp, um, and as Chriselle mentioned, um, I think that is a factor of having family and friends back home that they still communicate with. It's a great question. Well, let's jump to the next slide. I don't see any more questions in the chat at the moment. Um, so wrapping up, I mentioned earlier that we were going to chit chat briefly about Big Hearted. So the San Francisco Bay Area office has hosted a walk run ride earlier this year. It was super successful. Um, our partners at Wild Co hosted it for us and we raised around $20,000 for our clients who have so many needs. We are doing another one of these um, on December 3rd. In the chat is where you can uh, register if you'd like. It's $20 to register. You join us for about 15 minutes of fun, 30 minutes of chit-chatting with a lot of folks from Tahere, team captains, um, and then 45 minutes of endurance. Um, if you click that link that's in the chat, you'll learn more about it. And this is part of our Big Hearted, our annual Big Hearted campaign. Um, which has evolved, and this is this several iterations later, this is what the San Francisco Bay Area office is doing. Um, next slide. This is also, so again, this is the third uh, installment talking about the Tech Access Project. We have one more, um, and that is that will be on Wednesday, December 2nd from 7.30 to 8.30 um, Eastern. Um, we'll be doing a screening of our of the movie Torn Apart. It's a virtual screening. Again, you can register at tahare.org slash big hearted. And I think there's some more. There's more than where people can donate. More information up on the screen. And I do have, I'm so sorry, you guys. I am someone that works home with children. So that's what I have in the background. Um, I think we will stop presenting and answer any more questions that folks might have in this last minute. Thank you all for joining us. We've appreciated everyone on the call. Please feel free to reach out if you have questions that weren't answered. And we look forward to seeing you on December 2nd.